No problem. What makes a physical law fundamental? How do we go about finding the deepest and truest things about our universe? For centuries, we as physicists have been attacking this from the point of view of reductionism. Reductionism is the idea that I'll learn the truest and deepest things about the universe by reducing things to their smallest bits. So for example, we've taken matter and we've broken it down into its smallest bits and we found atoms. And then we took the atoms, smashed them together, broke them into pieces, and found that atoms are made of electrons and protons and neutrons. And we didn't stop there. We took the protons and the neutrons, we smashed them into each other, and we found that they're made of quarks. And we're still in the business of trying to find all of these smallest particles of the universe. Now, implicit in this idea that that's the way to find the truest and deepest things about the universe, implicit in that idea is a related idea that I can then take those bits, if I understand the smallest bits and how they work together, maybe I can build them back up and reconstruct everything. Maybe I can get a theory of everything and then predict what can be known about the universe. Now, there's one problem with that piece of the idea, and that is that reductionism can't answer every question that needs to be uh, addressed. So for example, here's the Mona Lisa, and the Mona Lisa is smiling. But she's smiling in kind of a subtle way. She's smiling with her eyes. Now we can ask the question, how did Leonardo da Vinci make her smile with her eyes? Now reductionism gives you an idea of how to tackle that question. Reductionism would say, okay, the way to tackle that question is to start with the colors. Let's look at the colors with which she's painted, and let's do a chemical analysis on the pigments. We'll break her into the smallest bits, and then we'll be able to build her back up. Now, how many of you think that by doing a chemical analysis of the pigments, we're going to find out why the Mona Lisa is smiling? Yeah, I thought so. So there are certain <laughs> questions that cannot be addressed with the reductionism philosophy. And in fact, um, the reductionism idea really is just a philosophy. It was handed down to us by the Greeks. It's a way of gaining knowledge that's gotten us a lot of mileage, but it can't necessarily be used to answer every question. Now, when we're trying to address questions in science, especially when we're after the questions of why does something happen, why did it happen this way, we're always looking for the broadest explanation, the explanation with the broadest explanatory power. So, uh, enter my field, condensed matter physics, and we mean uh, condensed in the sense of condensation. That is that gas condenses to liquid, liquid condenses to solid, that type of condensation. So we're really in the business of phases of matter and phase transitions. And we also study what electrons do inside of solids. It turns out that electrons inside of materials have their own phases of matter and their own phase transitions. And you're already somewhat familiar with this. You know that a metal can carry electricity, it can carry current. And when it's doing that, the electrons inside of the metal are flowing. Now, something that flows is a liquid. So the electrons inside of a metal are liquid. But it's very different inside of an insulator like plastic. Plastic doesn't have current flow through it. The electrons are stuck in there, and the electrons are solid-like in that type of material. So electrons inside of materials have their own phases of matter, their own phase transitions, and in fact, they have many, many more phases of matter than just solid, liquid, and gas, and that's my field of research. Now, one of the things that we've discovered in condensed matter physics in thinking about these phases of matter and phase transitions is that when you're studying large-scale behavior, and you do need many, many particles in order to observe a phase transition, when you're studying collections of many particles, often there is behavior that presents itself in the whole collection of particles, collective behavior, that seems to be quite independent of the constituents. And again, in answering the question of why, we're always looking for the broadest explanation. So for example, this is my cat. Her name is Marshmallow. And I named her Marshmallow because she's sweet and fluffy. And we could ask the question, why, it, why does she have fur? Okay, is it A, because she's Marshmallow? Is it B, because she's a cat? Or does she have fur because C, she's a mammal? Now we're looking for 
the broadest explanation. And in this case, the broadest explanation is that she's a mammal, and mammals all have some type of fur. Now, in the same way, I could ask a question about physics, and I could ask, why is this rock hard? Okay? Well, uh, a reductionist idea would say, okay, tell me what's in the rock, and then I'll be able to tell you why it's hard. Well, what's in this rock is calcium and carbon and oxygen, okay? And so the reductionist philosophy would tell you that this is hard because it's made of calcium, carbon, and oxygen. But there's a problem with that. This rock is also hard, and there's no carbon in it. It's got sulfur in it instead. So it's not fair to say that this rock is hard because it has carbon in it or that this rock is hard because it has sulfur in it. There's something very similar about the behavior of these hunks of matter that transcends the actual individual atoms that make it up. In fact, the reason that they're hard is because the atoms inside have a regular periodicity to them. They're in a crystalline structure, and that's the origin of the hardness. It's not because this rock has carbon in it or because this rock has sulfur in it. There's a larger organizing principle at work. Now, that's an example of what we call emergence. Emergence is when behavior happens at the large scale, at the scale of the collection of particles, collective behavior, that transcends the individual particles that make it up. And it's not just confined to physics. People also have emergent behavior. If you've been in a stadium and participated in the wave, you participated in a collective phenomenon that was emergent. Okay? Now, one of the ways that you know you have emergent collective behavior going on is that the behavior, when it arises at the level of the collection of particles, has some properties to it that are independent of the individual constituents. So, for example, if the wave is happening in a stadium, it doesn't matter whether it's a baseball stadium in Boston or a soccer stadium in Rio de Janeiro. When the wave happens, it looks more or less the same. And it doesn't matter whether uh, the fans are tall or whether they're short. It doesn't matter exactly who showed up that day, and it doesn't matter what color they're wearing. There's something about that wave that transcends the individual people that are making it up. In the same way, because it's an emergent phenomenon, it's not fair to say that that wave, or that it's not fair to say that all waves are due to people standing up and sitting down at the right time. The reason I know that's not the right explanation is because I've seen waves in other contexts. I've seen waves happen on water. Right now, you're hearing my voice because of compressional waves in the air that are carrying the sound to your ears. So waves, when they happen, all look more or less the same, but there's something about the wave, it's an emergent phenomenon that transcends the individual particles that make it up. Another way you can tell if you're dealing with an emergent phenomenon is that, again, it transcends the building blocks that make it up. So, for example, when you build a house, you could build a house out of brick or out of wood or out of stone, but it wouldn't be fair to walk into my home, look at the floor plan and say, oh, look how the kitchen flows into the dining room or how the dining room flows into the living room. It must be because of the particular bricks they used. That wouldn't quite be correct, right? The large-scale structure of the house transcends the actual bricks. I could use the same floor plan, but make it out of bricks or out of stone or out of wood. And that's another uh, clue that you have emergent behavior happening. Now, I think this idea of emergence opens up some really interesting and deep philosophical questions, deep questions even about who we really are as humans. And now I'm going to take off my physicist hat and I just want to talk as one human to another, I think this opens up you know, the interesting question of who really are you? I hear our society having echoes of reductionism in it. I hear the reductionist idea echoing around us that says, well, we're really just a collection of atoms. I'm made of atoms, I have DNA, and the reductionist idea would say that if I just understand your atoms and how they work together, and if I just understand enough about your DNA, not only can I predict what height you'll be when you grow up and what color hair you'll have, I can even predict who you'll be as a person and whether you like ketchup or mustard. Okay? But that idea that you as a human are determined by your atoms and by your DNA, that's a reductionist idea. And we already know that reductionism didn't even work for this hunk of rock, because the rock is too large and it's too complex to apply reductionism to it. Well, you're large and you're complex, larger and more complex than the rock. 
So that brings up the, the question in my mind of, of what really are we? Are we reducible to our atoms? Are you just your atoms? Or in the same way that the Mona Lisa's smile transcends her pigments, is it possible that the light in your eyes transcends your atoms? Are you just a collection of atoms and DNA? Or are you more than your atoms? Thank you.